crossroads. A few days later, Jim Thorpe stepped up to the plate for his first at-bat in the Eastern Carolina Baseball League. He dug his cleats into the dirt, raised the bat, and struck out. His second time up, he struck out again. Well, maybe he can pitch, the Rocky Mountain Railroaders manager figured. I told him I'd give it a whirl, Thorpe recalled. He won his debut 4-1. For Jim, who was used to winning track races and outrunning tacklers, baseball didn't come easy. Thorpe hit a modest 253 for the season and went 9-10 and as a pitcher. The Railroaders finished in the summer in last place. Jim Thorpe had fun anyway. On game days, local kids gathered in the hotel lobby to greet the ballplayers. When Jim came downstairs, his uniform, stained tan and green from the previous games, he always took the time to joke with the kids. He stood about 10 feet tall in my eyes, one of the boys would recall. To me, he was always a gentleman, a very gentle person. Thorpe earned $25 a week that summer, enough to live on, with a little spending money left over. In between games, he was a free man, or at least freer than he'd ever been at boarding school. At the time, when Jim Crow segregation laws ruled life in the South, Thorpe and his Carlisle friends occupied an uneasy ground between black and white. They were not banned from public places like restaurants and hotels, as black Americans were. The Indian athletes never knew how they were going to be treated. Joe Libby later told a story about walking through downtown Rocky Mount with Thorpe and Young Deer. A large white man blocked their way. When a white man approaches, he grumbled, you get off the sidewalk, get into the street. Thorpe turned to Libby and asked, Do you like this guy? No, Jim, said Libby. I don't like him very much. Thorpe turned to the man and punched him in the face. The three friends walked around the fallen body to the baseball field. All three, Libby recalled, spent that night in jail. When the baseball season ended, Thorpe decided not to return to Carlisle. Now a man of 21, he couldn't face giving up his freedom he'd earned over the summer. He moved in with his sister, pitching in on her Oklahoma farm. Warner thought Thorpe was making a huge mistake. Didn't he realize he was on the verge of national fame? Of course, the coach had his own reasons for wanting the star back on campus. With only average talent in 1909, the football team struggled. More and more colleges were getting serious about the game, and Carlisle's competition intensified as schools like Pittsburgh, Michigan, Penn State, and Army joined the ranks of top teams. Eager to gain any kind of edge, Warner was constantly telling interviewers how banged up his team was, even inventing injuries to key players in hopes of deceiving upcoming opponents. Before one game with Syracuse, he actually had healthy players limp onto the field with bandages wrapped around their limbs and heads. The moment the ball was kicked off, they tore off their bandages. In late November, Warner and his team traveled to Cincinnati, Ohio for a game with St. Louis University. Jim Thorpe came and watched from the sidelines as Joe Libby led the Indians to victory. When the team headed home, Warner traveled back to Oklahoma with Thorpe. They spent a few days hunting together. The coach urged Thorpe to come back to Carlisle, and Thorpe said he would. Neither left a detailed description of their conversations during these few days that the subject of baseball never came up. He claimed he had no idea Thorpe had played semi-pro ball in North Carolina. As soon as Pop headed east, Jim had second thoughts about returning to Carlisle. Sure, there was plenty to miss about the place, the camaraderie, the athletic dorm, football Saturdays, but Thorpe definitely didn't miss the rules, and he wasn't feeling particularly friendly towards Superintendent Friedman. Thorpe had written Friedman, asking the school to send the money he'd earned from the farm outings. Carlisle's policy was to hold on to students' earnings, doling out the cash as administrators saw fit. And Friedman dismissed Thorpe's request, condescending noting, It's customary at this school... When students desert, all funds to their credit are held upon their return. Thorpe stayed in Oklahoma, helping with the spring planting at his sister's farm. In the summer, he went back to North Carolina to play baseball. He hit just 236 in 1910 and went 10-10 on the mound. Thorpe had hoped to be picked up by a major league team, or at least a slightly better minor league team, but he got no offers. He rode the train back to Oklahoma and tried to settle into life on the farm. He couldn't. He just couldn't. As he'd done so many times before, he took off. Thorpe drifted from one town to another, taking odd jobs to get by, completely broke most of the time. He was too restless to stay in one place, but he had absolutely nowhere to go. I knew I stood on a crossroads, he would later say, and I was pondering on what I should do. Pop Warner was facing his own crossroads, or maybe the end of the road. 
Carlisle's 1910 football season was the worst in, dec- in a decade. Even when the team got attention, it was for the wrong reasons, like the erratic antics of Warner's left guard, as a Sweetcorn. Before being tossed from a game yet again, Sweetcorn demanded an explanation. Slugin, the ref told him. Did you see me? Out. Did you see blood? Out. When I slugs him, you see blood. Carlisle lost Syracuse, Princeton, Navy, Brown, and for the second straight year, Penn. The absolute rock bottom was a 3-0 defeat at the hands of Harvard Law School. Not the Harvard football team, just a bunch of law students. Pop Warner knew he couldn't justify his fat salary much longer. He had some good young players coming up, including a promising quarterback named Gus Welch. But what the coach needed was a difference maker. He needed a player good enough to turn things around in an instant. On a summer day in 1911, the ex-Carlisle star, Albert Accente, was strolling in the streets of Arcando, Oklahoma, now head football coach at Ottenberg College in Ohio. X was back home on vacation. Far up the street, he saw someone he recognized. Not the face. He was still too far away, but something about the man's rolling gait was familiar. Accente walked closer. He had been right. It was Jim Thorpe. The kid was more muscular than X remembered, thicker through the chest. Was this really a chance meeting, or was Extende on a mission for his old coach? X never said. Either way, the friends were happy to see each other. They shook hands. What are you doing? Nothing, said Thorpe. What have you been doing? Playing baseball. Did you graduate from Carlisle? No. Thorpe was a man of few words. Extende didn't need it spelled out. His friend was lost. Why don't you go back and finish at Carlisle? They wouldn't want me there now, said Thorpe. X said, you bet they would.